Hi there, greetings. Welcome to this day number 26 in the Digging Deeper Daily reading calendar. It is fun for me to share these scriptures with you. Genesis 42 and 43, Job 26 and Mark 16. Let's prepare to read Genesis 42. Yesterday, in chapter 41, we heard of Pharaoh's dream and what happened to Joseph as a result of his correctly telling the interpretation. Note also that Joseph was careful to give the glory to God for that interpretation. Genesis 42 When Jacob learned that there was corn in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why don't you do something? I hear that there is corn in Egypt. Go there and buy some to keep us from starving to death. So Joseph's ten half-brothers went to buy corn in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's full brother Benjamin with them because he was afraid that something might happen to him. The sons of Jacob came with others to buy corn because there was famine in the land of Canaan. Joseph, as governor of the land of Egypt, was selling corn to people from all over the world. So Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he acted as if he did not know them. He asked them harshly, "'Where do you come from?' We've come from Canaan to buy food, they answered. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. He remembered the dreams he had dreamt about them and said, You are spies. You have come to find out where our country is weak. No, sir, they answered. We have come as your slaves to buy food. We are all brothers. We are not spies, sir. We are honest men. Joseph said to them, No, you have come to find out where our country is weak. They said, We were twelve brothers in all, sir, sons of the same man in the land of Canaan. One brother is dead, and the youngest is now with our father. It's just as I said. You are spies. This is how you will be tested. I swear by the name of the king that you will never leave unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get him. The rest of you will be kept under guard until the truth of what you say can be tested. Otherwise, as sure as the king lives, you are spies. Then he put them in prison for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am a God-fearing man, and I will spare your lives on one condition. To prove that you are honest, one of you will stay in the prison where you have been kept. The rest of you may go and take back to your starving families the corn that you have bought. Then you must bring your youngest brother to me. This will prove that you have been telling the truth, and I will not put you to death. They agreed to this and said to one another, Yes, We are now suffering the consequences of what we did to our brother. We saw the great trouble he was in when he begged for help, but we would not listen. This is why we are in trouble now. Reuben said, I told you not to harm the boy, but you wouldn't listen, and now we're being paid back for his death. Joseph understood what they said, but they did not know it, because they had been speaking to him through an interpreter. Joseph left them and began to cry. When he was able to speak again, he came back, picked out Simeon, and had him tied up in front of them. Joseph gave orders to fill his brother's packs with corn, to put each man's money back in his sack, and to give them food for the journey. This was done. The brothers loaded their donkeys with the corn they had bought, and then they left. At the place where they spent the night, one of them opened his sack to feed his donkey and found his money at the top of his sack. "'Hey, my money has been returned to me,' he called to his brothers. "'Here it is in my sack.' Their hearts sank, and in fear they asked one another, "'What has God done to us?' When they came to their father, Jacob in Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. 
The governor of Egypt spoke harshly to us and accused us of spying against his country. We are not spies, we answered. We are honest men. We are twelve brothers in all, sons of the same father. One brother is dead, and the youngest is still in Canaan with our father. The man answered, This is how I will find out if you are honest men. One of you must stay with me, and the rest will take the corn for your starving families and leave. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I will know that you are not spies but honest men. I will give your brother back to you, and you can stay here and trade. Then when they emptied out their sacks, every one of them found his bag of money, and when they saw the money, they and their father, Jacob, were afraid. Their father said to them, Do you want to make me lose all my children? Joseph is gone, Simeon is gone, and now you want to take away Benjamin. I'm the one who suffers. Reuben said to his father, If I do not bring Benjamin back to you, you can kill my two sons. Put him in my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son cannot go with you. His brother is dead, and he's the only one left. Something might happen to him on the way. I am an old man, and the sorrow you would cause me would kill me. Genesis 43 The famine in Canaan got worse, and when the family of Jacob had eaten all the corn which had been brought from Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Go back and buy a little food for us. Judah said to him, The man sternly warned us that we would not be admitted into his presence unless we had our brother with us. If you are willing to send our brother with us, we will go and buy food for you. If you are not willing, we will not go, because the man told us we would not be admitted to his presence unless our brother was with us. Jacob said, Why did you cause me so much trouble by telling the man that you had another brother? They answered, The man kept asking about us and our family. Is your father still living? Have you got another brother? We had to answer his questions. How could we know that he would tell us to bring our brother with us? Judah said to his father, Send the boy with me and we will leave at once. Then none of us will starve to death. I will pledge my own life that you can hold me responsible for him. If I don't bring him back to you safe and sound, I will always bear the blame. If we had not waited so long, we could have been there and back twice by now. Their father said to them, If that's how it has to be, then take the best products of the land in your packs as a present for the governor. A little resin, a little honey, spices, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take with you also twice as much money, because you must take back the money that was returned in the top of your sacks. Maybe it was a mistake. Take your brother and return at once. May Almighty God cause the man to have pity on you, so that he will give Benjamin and your other brother back to you. As for me... If I must lose my children, I must lose them. So the brothers took the gifts and twice as much money and set out for Egypt with Benjamin. There they presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the servant in charge of his house, Take these men to my house. They're going to eat with me at noon. So kill an animal and prepare it. The servant did as he was commanded and took the brothers to Joseph's house. As they were being brought to the house, they were afraid and thought, We're being brought here because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time. They will suddenly attack us, take our donkeys, and make us his slaves. So at the door of the house they said to the servant in charge, If you please, sir, we came here once before to buy food. When we set up camp on the way home, we opened our sacks, and each man found his money in the top of his sack, every bit of it. We have brought it back to you. We have also brought some more money with us to buy more food. 
We don't know who put our money back in our sacks. The servant said, Don't worry, don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, must have put the money in your sacks for you. I received your payment. Then he brought Simeon to them. The servant took the brothers into the house. He gave them water so that they could wash their feet, and he fed their donkeys. They got their gifts ready to present to Joseph when he arrived at noon, because they had been told that they were to eat with him. When Joseph got home, they took the gifts into his house to him and bowed down to the ground before him. He asked them about their health and then said, You told me about your old father. How is he? Is he still alive and well? They answered, Your humble servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they knelt and bowed down before him. When Joseph saw his brother Benjamin, he said, So this is your youngest brother, the one you told me about. God bless you, my son. Then Joseph left suddenly, because his heart was full of tender feelings for his brother. He was about to break down, so he went to his room and cried. After he had washed his face, he came out and, controlling himself, he ordered the meal to be served. Joseph was served at one table and his brothers at another, The Egyptians who were eating there were served separately because they considered it beneath their dignity to eat with Hebrews. The brothers had been seated at table facing Joseph in the order of their age from the eldest to the youngest. When they saw how they had been seated, they looked at one another in amazement. Food was served to them from Joseph's table, and Benjamin was served five times as much as the rest of them. So they ate and drank with Joseph until they were drunk. (laughs) I think I like the last verse better in the New Living Translation, which says, So they feasted and drank freely with him. And now let's turn to Job 26. Yesterday, in chapter 25, Bildad only had a six-verse response, because Job interrupted him with the speech that we will read today. Bildad implied Job's guilt in more than one way, including this most obvious rhetorical question, can anyone be righteous or pure in God's sight? Job 26 And Job is speaking. What a fine help you are, poor weak man that I am. You give such good advice and share your knowledge with a fool like me. Who do you think will hear all your words? Who inspired you to speak like this? And the Good News Translation says that Bildad interrupts now. The spirits of the dead tremble in the waters under the earth. The world of the dead lies open to God. No covering shields it from his sight. God stretched out the northern sky and hung the earth in empty space. It is God who fills the clouds with water and keeps them from bursting with the weight. He hides the full moon behind a cloud. He divided light from darkness by a circle drawn on the face of the sea. When he threatens the pillars that hold up the sky, they shake and tremble with fear. It is his strength that conquered the sea. By his skill he destroyed the monster Rahab. It is his breath that made the sky clear, and his hand that killed the escaping monster. But these are only hints of his power, only the whispers that we have heard. Who can know how truly great God is? And now let's open to Mark 16. Yesterday we heard the story of the death and burial of Jesus. That chapter was full of fulfilled prophecies. Mark 16 After the Sabbath was over, Mary, the one from the village of Magdalene, 
Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, brought spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on Sunday morning, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they said to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? It was a very large stone. Then they looked up and saw that the stone had already been rolled back. So they entered the tomb where they saw a young man sitting on the right wearing a white robe, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised. Look, here is the place where they put him. Go now and give this message to his disciples, including Peter. He is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and ran from the tomb, distressed and terrified. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Verses 9 through 20 are the ending of this gospel according to some ancient manuscripts. After Jesus rose from death early on Sunday, he appeared first to Mary, the one from the village of Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. She went and told his companions. They were mourning and crying, and when they heard her say that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe her. After this, Jesus appeared in a different manner to two of them while they were on their way to the country. They returned and told the others, but they would not believe it. Last of all, Jesus appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating, He scolded them because they did not have faith and because they were too stubborn to believe those who had seen him alive. He said to them, Go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Believers will be given the power to perform miracles. They will drive out demons in my name. They will speak in unlearned languages. If they pick up snakes or drink any poison, they will not be harmed. They will place their hands on sick people who will get well. After the Lord Jesus had talked with them, he was taken up to heaven and sat at the right side of God. The disciples went and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and proved that their preaching was true by the miracles that were performed. Here is another shorter ending found in other ancient manuscripts. The women went to Peter and his friends and gave them a brief account of all they had been told. After this, Jesus himself sent out through his disciples from the east to the west the sacred and ever-living message of eternal salvation. Let me start us out in prayer today. Our glorious Heavenly Father, the Sovereign Lord of the whole universe, and our Lord Christ Jesus, who rose from death, Lord Jesus, we thank you that your resurrection has been proved over and over again, as we'll read in other Gospels. You ascended to heaven and sat down at the right of Almighty God. O Lord, our Father, what an amazing work it was to prepare the human race for the coming of Jesus and for him to come and sacrifice himself for us. And then, if we people say, Oh, I don't want to listen. Oh, I will find another way to be saved. We are so wrong. Lord, we pray that as your followers and as believers, we will take this message of the gospel to the whole human race that we will obey you in taking the call 
to spread this word everywhere. Just like you did with those early disciples, Lord, we ask that you will work with us and prove that our message is true by the miracles that you will perform.